Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone on our weekly colloquium. And today I have great pleasure to introduce Professor Bozona Czerny from our institute. Professor Czerny has been working here since 2015, uh, but she started her career at the Astronomical Center of the Polish Academy of Sciences as early as 1978. Uh, she did her PhD under Professor Paczyński and later Professor Stodulkiewicz. Uh, Professor Czerny is a world known specialist on active in active galactic nuclei and quasars. Um, her contributions are recognized uh, around the world. She was awarded the European Astronomical Society Prize in 2022. Uh, she also holds the only current ERC grant at our institute at Synergy Grant. Uh, so today she'll talk uh, about a fundamental, one of the really fundamental problems of astronomy, namely the problem of distance determination. So, Bozena, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So my my aim was to set uh, stage for, uh, I mean, mutual understanding between uh, people working in physics and in astronomy. So in my presentation, I, I will not concentrate really much on, on our results. Maybe at the very end, I will briefly mention them. But I would like to, 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 to show you that uh, really astrophysics can be done uh, reliably, something like that. I will try to avoid jargon. But it's hard to avoid jargon in, in astronomy, which is a few thousand years old, much older than physics. In, so for the beginning of astronomy, we only compete, I think, with mathematics in the sense of the natural numbers. They were probably first. And then there was astronomy. And then there was centuries or thousands of years and civics started. So we have a lot of things which comes from uh, from ancient times, we got used to it. But uh, okay, anyway. So I will talk about the measurements of the of the distance in in astronomy, and indeed that that uh, 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 already specifies. Right. Would you like to talk like off? Oh, it's okay. Right. Right. You want to do like light off? Uh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm not sure what because it's not. Oh, that's my right. Well, okay, it depends on, 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 on your for it's it's the same anyway. In, in physics, you, you are mostly used to, to the fact that you can uh, set your experiment, go around the table, look at the thing you study from every angle you prefer. In the case of astronomy, we look into the sky, right? We cannot go around uh, uh, our objects most of the, of the time. Nevertheless, there are also some similarities because uh, in, even in physics, this is not that you can judge your experiment just looking at what is happening, right? You need some measurement, which is between your eyes and what is happening. So the, there are also similarities, particularly if you think about uh, particle physics or something like that. So it's not that much different, I, I, I think. So just to present my group, because my group is not always coming to those seminars. That's true. I think I listen <laughs> to of the guys, not not the other two. <laughs> oh, okay. actually. So it's only Mohammed who is online, I suppose. It was too far to come. And there are two students, but I, I didn't uh, have their photographs. They are just uh, five year students uh, helping with, with the data. So actually, what we are doing is also determination of the distance to some extent, but I will start from the beginning, how we really measure the distance. And I will skip historical facts because historically it started with parallaxes and I will talk about parallaxes in a moment, 
But right now, if we think about modern uh, astronomy, then uh, in the case of solar system, we have really uh, direct measurements and actually we go around our object, right, using satellites. And the uh, accurate uh, distance measurement is, is done using uh, radio or microwaves, so you can measure the time light, light needs to go to the object and back, and in, in, this, in such way we can also measure not only the distance, but the shapes, etc. A lot of advanced uh, astronomy is really done with, with this methodology. It started in, in, in the 50s, but during the satellite epoch, our solar system is really well, well measured. And here I will I'll, uh, have to introduce one basic uh, unit of the distance, which is the one astronomical unit. For centuries, that was quite difficult to measure. And the definition of this astronomical unit is the mean distance between Earth and Sun. So when the measurement quality uh, was not very high, uh, it was enough to make a correction for the electricity of the, of the Earth orbit, and then people calculated the average distance between uh, perihelion and aperion. Nowadays, the accuracy of measurement is so high that the, even the concept of uh, uh, observation and determination of the astronomical union, uh, astronomical unit is uh, without any, any good sense because it changes. It changes also with the motion of Jupiter, for example. So you have yearly drifts uh, all the time. So now, Starting from 2012, the uh, International Astronomical Union introduced a definition. So why one astronomical un unit is this number of meters you see with two zeros here. That's fixed. That's a definition. That's a definition. Of course, for some aspects, you need to know the position of air, sun, whatever, with much higher accuracy than that. But it's perfectly available. But right now, as you need, this is just a definition right now. And if we think how far this direct probing of the solar system goes, this is Voyager 2 is the, the most distant object right now, artificial object. It was launched in uh, 1977, so it was before you were born, right? Yes. And it's still active and it sends measurements. Now the distance is uh, something like 132 astronomical units. You see the precision because, of course, it's kind of a later determination of, of the distance. And even light takes 18 hours to reach from the Voyager 2 to us. Uh, this, this information comes from a few days ago because then I was preparing the presentation. But if you are interested in exactly what is the distance today, you can check for daily update on that page. You will have the daily update of this distance. This is so, distance between us and, us, the, exactly. and the sun? Us. And Voyager too. Ah, Voyager. Voyager. So this is a special web page devoted to Voyager. What is the distance to sun then in this unit? In this unit one. Oh. From, so where, from, where from, Earth, to sun? from Earth to sun, it is one by definition. Sort of, right? Okay. Currently it will be changing, but within few percent, right? But Voyager is what? Where is Voyager? Close to the sun? No. It's 132 astronomical units from yes. us, but also from Sun, right? So it already left heliopause 
it is more distant it's, uh, than all the all the planets which we normally study. So you have planets, right? Uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, whatever. It is much farther away. So sun is sending uh, wind, and this wind propagates in the space, and finally it hits the interstellar medium where the shock falls. It is well beyond all planets which we study. And Voyager already crossed this shock. It was very interesting to, to perform measurements when it was crossing. So it's now heading towards the nearest stars, but of course, that will take time. <laughs> it will not happen during our life. So this is our direct exploration of, of space. It's really impressive. So now uh, I will talk about basic distance measurement, which was a parallax, and that was already applied in ancient times. And before the current satellite uh, period, that was the only way how we could measure distances, and we successfully measured distance. So the basic idea, of course, is, is uh, very simple. Imagine that you go by car and you see a tree which is not too far from, from you. And in the background, you have some mountains, distant mountains, whatever, along the horizon. And then if you, if you move by car to another location, then see the tree will look in a different way uh, against the background, right? It will it will move. So you have to measure the distance between position one and position two in meters, and then you have to measure this angle. So, for example, this angle you can easily measure if you do the panorama of yourself, right? If you do panorama, then panorama will be three hundred sixty degrees, and then this shift from this to this, divided by 360 degrees, will give you the angle. And now you do simple geometry. So then you, you see, you do not have to go to the tree, but you need certainly uh, uh, objects at infinity to measure against. Otherwise, it will not work. So the basic, okay, so in, in, in the case of uh, astronomy, we are not interested in measuring the distance from the car to the, <laughs> to the tree, but we are interested in measuring the distance to, uh, to stars. And for, for that, we need some kind of emotion, right? Because we have to uh, change the position. And of course, to, to, we have a natural motion, namely Earth going around the sun. So in half a year, you move from the position in, in January to position in, in July. You have nearby star, and then you meet uh, this uh, distant background, and uh, uh, quasars are really perfect for this distant background. So you make two photographs of the sky. This is your uh, quasar, and this is your star, the green dot. And then next time, quasar didn't move because quasars are really very distant. But star is shifted, right? So then again, if you if you know the, the, the scale on this uh, picture, you can calculate the angle and to calculate the distance. And this is why you need a, a astronomical units because this distance is to astronomical units. So historically, uh, this method allowed to go to the nearby stars. And then you needed really several steps in between to cover most of the stars in our galaxy. That is pretty complicated. So 
I will jump and I will skip this historical aspect. And I will tell you about Gaia satellite. So Gaia satellite is working now. You can see here more or less the size because this is in the, in the laboratory. And this is really monitoring the, the, the sky, measuring uh, continuously all the positions of all stars. And then this instrument allows you to measure the uh, distances to many stars. So then uh, also we introduce new unit because astronomical unit is far too small. It's not really convenient because we would have a lot. So because of the method which I showed on the previous slide, right? This angle is the, giving us the, the distance. Then we introduce a unit which is one parsec. This is one, uh, this is the distance corresponding to this angle of one arc second. And this is really a unit which is used very much or practically continuously in, in astronomy up to quite high distances before we jump to redshift. So in Gaia, uh, uh, data release tool, you can have measurements with accuracy of 0 0.04 milli arc seconds. So you see how the precision, which is really needed. In ancient times, this precision was of order of a fraction of arc second. So then the distance measured was up to few percent. Now we have precision. 10 to 5 times better, a bit worse, but 10 to 4 times better for a uh, brighter source. So with this instrument, they measured uh, distance to one, uh, 1 billion of stars in our galaxy. Excuse me, what I'm asking. I still, I didn't understand. You need to know this angle. Yes. But this is the angle between your first point Final point and what? What is the third point? Well, the, the, the Earth is moving, right? I understand, but what is the reference? Uh, quasars. Ah, very good. Quasars. Quasars. Chosen. quasars are excellent reference because yes. there are the same number of quasars and stars and on the sky if you look for the same. Yeah, same could you please recall the definition of what is quasar? Quasar is a so in, in every decent well developed galaxy like the Milky Way, we have the central part which consists of a supermassive black hole with masses uh, from 10 to 5 to 10 to 10 solar masses. And on that central black hole, Material accretes. In some galaxies, like Milky Way, there is a shortage of material. So this nucleus is not very bright, and formally we do not classify that as, as active galaxy. In the case of quasars, the amount of material is uh, millions or actually billions times higher than in the case of the Milky Way. So then the material before it falls into the black hole, it shines because it dissipates part of the energy. It has to dissipate the angular momentum, shortly speaking. So then the emission can be 1,000 times brighter than all the stars in the host galaxy. And this is why you can see quasars from very, very large distance. But to take a follow-up, if I may, how big is this uh, active nucleus and its size? In... Oh, the, the black hole mass is very small. No, no, but the but the, no, the, medium size, the diameter of the illuminating area. No, the, the radiating area. The uh, active nucleus of the galaxy, how, how big it is, uh, the diameter more or less? 
It's parsecs or no, it's it's much less. It's ten to less. ten to minus five parsecs. Oh. Ah, so it's a very yeah. pretty yeah. object. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, a it's, it's something like ten to five plus, and it depends on the black hole mass for the ten to eight solar masses. Black hole. This is the resulting centimeter. This is the, okay. the size of the short shell rate. And most of the radiation comes from the distance of 10 short shell. It's tiny. It's tiny. Thank you. Okay, so going back to, to Gaia with this oops. No, I wanted to use the pointer. Uh, with this accuracy, we can marginally reach distances of 25 kiloparsecs. And this painter uh, sources are less accurate, so it's then. So this is how roughly the situation looks like. Of course, this is not the, the result. This was actually a picture made before, the, before Gaia was launched to advertise what we will measure. So here you see sun is here and the center of the galaxy is here. So sun is located really at the peripheral part of the, of the galaxy. And this is, so this is the whole Milky Way galaxy schematically. And this is 10 kiloparsecs. So we say <laughs> painter sources, we, we know everything here in this uh, region. And 20 kiloparsecs are already here. So really with Gaia, we, men, we measure significant fraction of stars in the galaxy. The whole galaxy is well sampled. You don't need separate steps and set steps and steps to reach that. Of course, there are still slight discussions about the accuracy, because the needed accuracy is quite extreme. But basically, that, that's it. So you don't need uh, anything more. You, you just know all the stars in, in the galaxy, and then you can uh, measure the distance to different types of stars uh, mm, in this way, just using this uh, parallax uh, method. But we cannot go beyond the galaxy, right, with parallax. Even I, I, I said that those distant quasars or active galactic nuclei, they are considered as not moving. So you cannot uh, uh, use this. So to go further, we really need uh, uh, distance ladder, next step, next method. And this was the breakthrough which was made uh, 100 years ago. And actually this method allowed uh, uh, to discover the, the expansion of the universe by Hubble and a number of other things. So it's really underlying all the major discoveries in in uh, astronomy. So how, how that was done? Uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt, you see here the, the, the picture. She discovered so-called period luminosity relationship for very special type of stars, which are named C variables. variables. I will, I will discuss this uh, in a moment in the next uh, slide. And she, she published uh, uh, first results already in 1808. So C are a very special class of pulsation, of pulsating stars. So they, they change the uh, brightness by some 25% in a couple of days or in a fraction of a day. Those are radial pulsations, so they are really very, very strong. 
So schematically, uh, people make something like the luminosity and here time. And this is what happens to the luminosity of the star. It's not quite symmetric because the pulsation is, is related to the opacity uh, instability in the outer envelope of the, of the star. But it, it, it looks like that. So it goes up and down, up and down. Uh, that said, it would not be so interesting, but uh, well, there are two things which are important. The small mass is Sun and up to 100 times more luminous. So we see those stars, C fate stars, in other galaxies. So if we calibrate stars in our galaxy, we can go to other galaxies. We will see C fate stars there. And here is the picture. I will stop on, on that also on the next slide, where here. There is logarithm of the time, not linear time. And here is the uh, high luminosity point and low luminosity. So here is high luminosity point and low luminosity point uh, in, uh, la, in small matter uh, clouds. This is what, what she studied, and you see a perfect relation, linear relation. So you can establish this relation using C phase stars in our galaxy, and then you can go to all galaxies where you can find the same type of, of stars. Of course, it's not that simple. Anyway, to put everything in the proper perspective, because it's quite quite interesting story by itself. How it happened that she was working on the project. At the time, women were not scientists, right? Here was Edward Peter, and he was uh, uh, in charge of the uh, Harvard sort of observation and to analyze those observational data and to perform all those observations. They needed a lot of staff, and it was quite expensive to pay men, right? So he hired women, and they were performing those observations and analysis of computers. Staff then really were limited to technical work, and they didn't uh, progress much beyond that, but there were few who really shaped our uh, understanding. That was one of, the, of those, but there was also Anne Cannon. She introduced stellar classification, which is used by now. She, on her own, it was not being suggested. With uh, uh, there is uh, Something which I'm not absolutely sure because the first paper actually uh, contains tables and her conclusion. So her conclusion was it is also noticeable that those having the longest period, uh, it is worthy to notice the brighter variables have the longer periods. But there was no plot in this paper. The plot was in the next paper. So first paper was by her. Just oh sorry, she was the author. And without reading glasses, I I in the darkness I cannot see really what I should do. Sorry. So she was just the, the, the author of this paper. It was published like that. The next paper. Yes. Uh, you have to click the screen again. Okay. So the next paper was published four years later, 
It was very short paper, just a table with those uh, promising stars. And with a plot, one plot was when uh, linear time was using, and then here luminosity in magnitudes. I will I will say a few words uh, in a minute. And here is this logarithmic time and magnitudes here. So you only see this period luminosity relation nicely when you use log log plot. So this paper was actually signed by Pickering. On the other hand, he's, he, he wrote that the following statement regarding the periods of 25 variable stars in the small Magellanic cloud has been prepared by Miss Libby. I don't know who realized that this is the right method to plot. Maybe he was also talking to other guys, maybe somebody else suggested, hard to say, but it was really a huge progress from statement, general statement that, oh, there is some relation to the statement that there is a perfect relation. By the way, magnitudes. This is something which is traditionally used in uh, astronomy. So this is the method to measure the observed plants. So the modern as, uh, definition, I think I, for, I forgot to make this, so I will go to the blackboard again. Sorry for that. Um, okay, here. So now we use the definition that magnitude minus 2.5 logarithm of the plus plus certain constant and constant, of course, depends on the wavelength, etc. Uh, historically, how it, it happened and why flux is measured in magnitude. Uh, in, in ancient Greeks, Greek people defined uh, magnitude zero as the brightest star, and that was, uh, I think it was bigger. So, and then phi was something like a run, right? Like a run. That was marginally visible by next up. And then you had steps like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you didn't go low. So this was the brightest, this was the same. Of course, nowadays you don't see five magnitudes in the CT, you are happy if you see 0 or 1. But if you go to the lights, uh, Night lights far, something like that, then you can see up to uh, five magnitude. And this is few few thousand stars which are as bright as, as that. So this magnitude remained with us, but of course we don't use I to judge the magnitude, but we use this definition, which and because the I is working in logarithmic uh, steps by nature. Then later it was a good approximation of customary union. And it, so this is logarithmic. So here you have the uh, magnitudes. And you also can notice if you if you are closer by that here is 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So the axis goes down, right? In order to keep the intuitive plot, the brighter object is on the top. So in astronomy, you always plot the magnitude axis going down in order to see that the brighter sources are on the top of the plot. Okay, you can you can read this. Actually, it's power law, right? The dependence of uh, brightness and versus period. It's a power law, right? It's a time to the power. Fractional power. Yes. So this is the luminosity. This is not luminosity. This is log period, right? Yeah, but on the left is real, real thing. And this is a, a, a time linear, not log. Yeah, okay. So this is power log. Yeah. But then it's not so elegant, right? This is elegant. And this is because then you have a straight line. 
and straight line is easy to discuss and this is what is actually discussed so for example even before Gaia then it was more difficult to calibrate things but you you have more modern period luminosity relation from Wendy Friedman you will see here uh, still magnitudes because that's traditional then you have a logarithm a logarithmic axis that you see very strong 10 days to 100 days and uh, Milky Way C phase here are marked with those points and then C phase in another galaxy this small Magellanic cloud they are generally brighter and have longer period only one C Milky Way C phase on that plot overlaps so you see it's easy to say that we calibrate everything according to everything, but this matching is not always uh, uh, perfect. In the case of, of uh, that previous plot, she uh, the matching was not so important because she studied all stars in one uh, galaxy, which is uh, quite distant small Magellanic cloud or large Magellanic cloud. So she could assume that all stars are actually identical. But then if you want to use that later for different things, then you have to, to take care about other aspects. So this, I, I told you that I will skip those intermediate steps, which is not fully justified because the period, this radius luminosity or, sorry, the period luminosity relation, my mistake, from a data release from, from Gaia doesn't look that well. There is a lot of scattered here on this diagram. So now we had, so at that time, actually additional scaling was used. With, so first it was, everything was scaled to a uh, large Magellanic cloud and actually um, the, the leader of this ERC grant, which I'm in, there are four of us participating, Grzegorz Pietrzyński, he determined the distance to, to large Magellanic cloud using binary stars. But the method is so complicated that I would need, I uh, think, a specific lecture to explain how it, how it is done. And that, that distance was, was really used by Adam Rees in his determination of, of the Hubble constant. On the other hand, now we have the uh, data release tree from Gaia. And this is also part of, the, of this ERC project. But this is not what, what uh, I am doing. Uh, Pierre Calvera will be working on that, and then we will have the direct uh, uh, calibration of C phase stars from Gaia data in this stream. This is at least our hope. Some people already tried that, also it's not quite working. We will have two, met two independent methods, not just parallax, but some other way to determine the distance to, to, to see parallaxy, which will be done like Volkan uh, Kieren, and I'm not uh, involved in that. So, uh, yes. I think I missed it. So, how is the distance distance measured using C phase? Uh, I'm sorry, I just missed. Well, uh, because the, you have a distance. And, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Going back to this. So we from we have from the, the, yes from from uh, from the study of parallax, you have the distance to each C phase. Mm -hmm. And then if you know the distance, 
you, you of course know the observed flux. So you can ca calculate the absolute luminosity of the disk, of, of the source. And this is already what was done here because of this observed magnitude. Here they use big N. Big N is the absolute luminosity. So you can imagine that you have here absolute luminosity in X per second. And you have those things calibrated from this uh, distance, which is uh, measured with uh, geometry. Now, if you discover uh, C-phase, which are much more distant, then you can measure the year period right let's say eight days and then you read from this what is their absolute luminosity and then knowing absolute luminosity and knowing observed luminosity with luminosity which is simple you calculate the distance and i will say a few words about really distance definition but this is distance to see field right not to some other object. Yeah, this is exactly yes, it's the, it's a distance to, to the C phase. But if you uh, see a very distant galaxy and then you discover a C phase star there, you measure the period, you determine the distance to the star, and then you assume that well, it's a representative distance to that galaxy. So historically, you see that there was a gap between parallax. This is schematic view of the, of the distance ledger. So there was not much overlap between parallax method and C phase method. Now we will have this more overlap. Otherwise, there were some other things. I will not really talk about that because they are difficult. And then you will see that. Uh, well, from C phase, with C phase, you can go to several megaparsecs, but you will still not measure the expansion of the universe, and you need to rely later on overlap between C phase variables and type one supernovae, which form the next. So what are type one supernovae? They are a bit under discussion. So more or less, it's clear that we you need a kind of uh, binary star. And finally, you should end up during the evolution with a white dwarf and something else it does not matter probably what else, but supplying the material onto white dwarf. White dwarf is a degenerate star, but it can be degenerate up to certain mass. If this mass is exceeded, and this is the Chandra Sekhar limit, then the star has to collapse or it has to burst out or something. The details are not yet well established. It seems like the star actually does not reach on the second limit, but it starts to burn carbon. And then, you know, it's like thermonuclear flash. And then the whole star is really disrupted. And you see something which is really uh, very bright and, and huge. Uh, so C phase take you to more or less uh, a modern C phase with uh, Hubble Space Telescope take you to, to 30 megaparsec, but you cannot go farther. While type one A supernova, special type, are brighter by a factor of five billion times more than sun and 10 to four times more than the most luminous C phase. So 10 to 4 allows you to go even more distance. So the exact uh, 
mechanism of the house bells is not yet well established, but they really look similar with respect to the absolute luminosity. They are not identical, but they are quite similar and they can be scaled. So this is a collection of light curves of such supernovae. Here you have the units of uh, sun luminosity time in, in, in days. So you see some are less luminous, some are more luminous, uh, if we know the distance to them independently. And then you see that those low, low, uh, high, with higher luminosity, they fade more slowly. So people invented a way of stretching to know whatever. And then if you use those coefficients of pushing up and down and stretching, then you can have uh, something which is uh, identical. So then the methodology is uh, like that. You observe the distant uh, supernova 1a, then you, you look at the time scale, and then you know whether you have to push it this way or that way or what, and then it achieves this universal luminosity. And then knowing of self luminosity, you calculate the distance to the star. Ten minutes. Well, I will stop at some point anyway, because you know I, I was prepared that maybe not all the material will be used. And now we are going to distances which are quite large. And then the expansion of the universe matters. So now I was talking about distance, 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 but uh, there is not a single definition in the of the distance in the expanding universe. So you have to Commuting distance, angular diameter distance, luminosity distance, and this is what I'm using, and this is what supernova 1a people are using, and uh, light travel uh, distance. So here you have a plot of uh, the value of the distance, and here you have redshift. So instead of distance on that axis, we now plot redshift which uh, describes the, the expansion of, of the universe, the velocity, etc. So this luminosity distance is something more or less linear in that case, because this is log log plot. But for example, for the angular distance, you see something funny. It's not monotone. So I tried to make a in qualitative explanation why it's not monotonic. If you if you are here and you look back, this is your light cone in flat, not expanding universe. This would be this blue thing, but it is expanding. So actually, Big Bang was here, and then everything was compact. So then, in expanding universe, your light cone looks like this shape. So then you, you have uh, something of a fixed size, then it's, it looks uh, bigish, and then if you go more, it looks smaller, right, for the angular size. But now it, it again starts to look bigger. It works like that, and it's actually used to, um, for people using the size of the radio source as a measure of the cosmology, because then most of the radio sources are on that key. <laughs> then you have to simplify the job. Can you explain what is the meaning of this red line? Is it the edge this of the universe? Cone. This is the light cone in expanding universe. Okay, so the this is the age of the universe, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, if you measure the time, this would be this commuting time 13.7 uh, uh -huh. years. Mm -hmm. So this light cone has to converge because. Uh, at, at the beginning, it was important. Yeah? Yes, it was also compact.
So in the case of, of uh, supernovae 1A or in the case of, of our method of using quasars, we actually use luminosity distance. And this is exactly the definition of the luminosity distance, that the absolute luminosity is 4 pi times the luminosity distance squared times the observed flux. So if you use, if you know the observed flux and you, if you know the absolute luminosity, this is the distance which you should use. Of course, if you want to know to which geometry, which model it, it, it corresponds, then you have to look at Friedman equations, uh, for example, in the case of Friedman and the Robertson Walker uh, model, you can take another model, etc. And in a specific model, you know what is the luminosity distance as a function of redshift. So then if you measure flux, if you measure the absolute luminosity and you have the luminosity distance at a given redshift, you can convert that to cosmological model using specific um, equations. Of course, uh, here you have some global parameters like Hubble uh, parameter measured at this moment and some other parameters, global parameters. Everything else, redshift dependence is hidden here for this model. So the conversion is not simple, but it's of course doable. So for example, uh, uh, then using the supernovae, uh, people like Adam Rees went to uh, claim the, the accelerated expansion and the tension with the with lambda CDM. Uh, what I wanted to show you that things are never very simple. They only found 42, and this is the most recent day, okay, 42 supernovae 1A calibrated with C-phase stars. So this overlap, this calibration is actually pretty small. But this is what you have at this moment. At least when when you calibrate supernovae 1A with C phase. Of course, he supported himself with a few other things and bits, but it's tricky. It's only 42 objects which are well calibrated. And then so you see here you have two objects, and then you have uh, hundreds of those there, but Okay, it's not simple. So for example, uh, when using this method, you determine the Hubble uh, parameter, which is the, the current expansion rate of the universe. Then using a uh, uh, C-phase calibration, this is the most recent uh, claim, you have 73. Of course, in such stupid methods, you need, uh, you know, of course, it's actually one over second, but then it would not be readable to astronomers. Because this is kilometers, this is megaparsec, it's all also kilometers, they, they do cancel. But yes. On the other hand, Wendy Friedman, is using another calibration. I will not talk about it, but this is the tip of the red giant branch. Another calibration which, call it, which needs to be calibrated with secondary calibrators, whatever. But nevertheless, she is getting something like that. And she's quite careful. She, came, she claims also systematic error. Adam Rees never says about anything about systematic error. So, and what I wanted to stress is that the difference uh, between those two values of the Hubble constant, if you look at redshift one, you can calculate the luminosity distance for those two values, assuming other global parameters the same. 
So then you have 6,300 megaparsecs and 6,600 megaparsecs. And if I didn't make a mistake, that means just 5% difference in determination of the luminosity distance. So, so think how accurate it must be to claim something here. I didn't mention about extinctions, other things, right? Anyway, there are also other methods. So I will not talk about them. And I will just flash something which we are now doing. We use quasars, as I said, those active galactic nuclei, which are powerful sources of radiation. And the continuum is emitted from very compact region. The thing is surrounded by clouds. And these clouds reprocess the variable emission from the nucleus with some delay. We measure this delay. And measuring this delay, we use a relation between the delay and the absolute luminosity. When we don't have this method calibrated, we need additional calibration of the method. So here is our, our plot from, from my recent review. And two more methods are under development. First, we hope to have those alpha and beta from the model. And this is what Mohammed Nadaf is doing. His PhD defense will be in about one month, but at Copernicus Center because it was too astronomical for you. <laughs> and uh, yes, Ashwani also will, will uh, calculate the emissivity. So there is always a lot of dirty work behind each step. It seems simple, but it's not that simple. Of course, we calculate all those trajectories, whatever is 3D picture with MCBT, and then we will have those alpha and beta things. And then another method more, which would not require calibration, is just a continuous time delay. But it was proposed in 1999, and it was never worked. Mostly because of the contamination by those uh, broad emission lines, which I just mentioned. So Vikram is now working on, on making that doable, but uh, nobody succeeded yet to measure the Hubble constant uh, with that method. I mean, with reasonable error, right? This, this guy used this method, but he, he got something like 40 which was clearly wrong. OK. So thank you very much, Professor Mellon. Thank you, speaker. We have time for a couple of questions. So maybe I will first ask if there's anybody uh, uh, in the uh, uh, among the people who are listening remotely who would like to ask a question. No, no questions. No questions. Okay, so maybe somebody from the audience here. Um, yes. I have a question. Uh, you gave or asked a unit of distance for like the method of separate measurement, so distance measurement. Mm -hmm. But can you give us like uh, approximately how far it is? Because like those measure, those those units do not mean anything for me to be honest. Like. Uh, for, so, for example, for parallax, you gave that uh, it's almost like our whole galaxy. And how far is like this uh, separate method uh, reaching? Is well, like to, to a number of, 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 of galaxies, but okay. not covering uh, most galaxies. I, I know, I know. So, like, it's like our kind of local group or something like that. So, I'm not sure how, because in centimeters it will not have. No, right? no, 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 no. It's like, uh, so, so it's like, uh, 30 megaparsecs, this is something which they claim, and the usual distance between 
a galaxy is something like one megaparsec. So you can calculate how many galaxies you have okay. in 30. Okay. It's a cube, right? So it's a 30 to power cube. Several yeah, thousand yeah. of galaxies. Okay, in principle, right. not necessarily in practice, but at least the number of galaxies there. Yeah. While in the whole universe, we have yeah. okay. many more. Okay, Masaya. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so if we could build uh, like um, a telescope or something on uh, like other like planet, let's say like some. Like that, we could like more like distance to do like survey like so like it does does it help to like improve the accuracy or we need more like no because like, we, you you like so you need that, it, it, two views right from two so if so like you know we we have like we, we are using the uh, the diameter of R. Right. So, like, yes, to some extent, yes, because if you if you imagine that, uh, for example, this is this Voyager is, is able to do something like that, then for, for example, this is the, 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 the sun, this is the earth position, right? This is our yearly motion, and now Voyager is one factor more distant. So, if this Voyager will be able to make uh, observations of that quality, mm -hmm. and then uh, this kind of uh, motion took something like what 50 years because it was launched in 77. So you still need to be patient because you need first the snapshot here. And then you, you have to wait for that much time, which is around 50 years, right? To reach this position, and then your view will change. But then, of course, you will gain this time. Okay, so uh, the, the, there's a question from uh, from Volker Fred, who's listening remotely. Uh, what if there is some kind of physical effect that connects the local astrophysics to background cosmology? This would bias our distance estimates. Can we perform some kind of independent measurements for calibrating against such biases? Well, those biases will, will depend on, on the method. Yes. Exactly. If, for example, you use uh, uh, gravitational wave method, they are not very much sensitive, for example, to extinction. They are not sensitive at all to extinction. On the other hand, they are now not very accurate. They have an error of 10, 20%, something like that, which is not enough for cosmological application. So it, each method you choose uh, has its own bias. It's not that there is something that is universal, which, uh, of course, you need some, some universal aspects are from in, in propagating light, but then it depends on the wavelength. Okay, so thank you much. Thank you very much for the reply. I think it's already uh, 1337, so, so it's, it's, it's past our time. If you want to ask Bozuna more questions, please do it privately and let's thank Bozuna again. <laughs>